When I started my podcast about eight or nine months ago, of course I didn't get that many views on those initial podcasts. So I've decided to replay some of them for you and bring them up to the top of the list because they were too good to miss. And this episode, I speak with John Woodruff. He was a minister, he weighed 245 pounds, and now he's in great shape and he's in the 160 range. He tells how he did it and he tells about coming out, his ministry that he used to be involved in, and a whole bunch of other things. I think you're going to like this one. Don't miss listening to it. Good afternoon. Wilkinson here. Today I'm with my friend John Woodruff, and I was just thinking I don't even know where to start with him. He's so interesting, and there's so many roads we could go down with him. But basically, I met him at a pool party, I think about two years ago. And of course, he's pretty gorgeous. He's got a great body. And I thought, I want to photograph this guy. So we chatted. He came over. We did a couple of photo shoots. Then a little while later, I was reading something he posted on Facebook and I didn't know his story, but his story was very interesting. He didn't always look like this. Say hi, John. Hello. Tell us, you know where I'm going with that. Uh, I know where you're going with that. So tell me a little about it. Okay. So first of all, a quick, (laughs) that photo when I was, I referenced myself as at, at that time in my life, is I call myself Fat Johnny back then. I wasn't always like that. That was about a two-year period in my life. I was always an athlete. I played basketball, so I was always running, and I was relatively lean for my size, I guess. And I got diagnosed with degenerative disc disease and a lot of poor food decisions and a little bit of depression. Everything stacks on top of each other when you can't really move a lot because your back is so in pain all the time led me to gain all that weight and that's why i looked that way for about two and a half years so when i lost all the weight and got back in shape i was i wasn't for the first time ever now lean and fit because i was normally that way but i was up to 240 what was your your weight at the height about 240 245 and i'm currently what do you weigh now 168 today i think wow and that's that's my you know healthy your ideal yeah yeah Yeah. for 511 i think i'm 511 oh so. And we were chatting before this, and you said you're now a full-time trainer. Is that yes, true? Yes, full-time personal training. I did a little bit of it back in Texas, but out here in California, especially in Palm Springs, it's just like the perfect place for people to want to be in shape year-round because it's always sunny here, and it's always warm, and you're always kind of at a pool party at some point. <laughs> at exactly. Least eight months out of the year. <laughs> That's why I avoid them. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> Like you're good, good. <laughs> okay, so why do you want? Why are you a trainer? Uh, the main reason is I just absolutely love helping people feel better about themselves. At the core of it, like I want people to feel confident about who they are. Uh, when they look in the mirror, it's important to feel good about yourself and to help your body reach like its potential. And when you can help your body reach its potential, like everything works well on the inside when you have it looking good on the outside and vice versa. Right. Uh, And I find it just so rewarding to help people achieve the small goals leading up to a nice fit, healthy body. Uh, There's just nothing better uh, than uh, helping someone not only lose weight and feel better, but like have more energy and like just get a sense of like life is amazing. It's wonderful. And I have this new body, you know, that I've worked for, you know, to now drive and do and live and create and just explore. And it's just, it just feels good like to help people at the, at the end of it. Uh, so we're in Palm Springs yeah. and our, the demographic here is we're not all spring chickens. No, so, but that's why I moved what, here. What are, what are the, uh, <laughs> pardon me? I said, that's why I moved here. Oh, really? Do you like that? I like older guys. Yes, for sure. Oh, oh do you? Yes. Oh, wait, you're gay? I mean, slightly. <laughs> you didn't know. I'm kidding. Yes, I am. I'm and gay. my partner is older than me. And I would say, I guess you could say significantly, because I'm 40, I'll be 42 in a month, and he's 73. Whoa. But uh, he looked, when he met me, let me just say this real fast. He met me at the Fat Johnny stage. So I was like 245. And then I, and then I got in shape with him, and he had a six pack and was ripped. You know, he was just in incredible shape, and he still is. When you met him, he when was I like met that? him, I was big, right? No, was he in no, shape? No, he was. Yeah, he was shredded. Wow, like he was fit. Um, so the cool thing about that is, like, I knew that I didn't know I was going to get back in shape, but he had no idea, and so he kind of like we fell in love, 
and he didn't fall in love with me because I'm like fit or whatever because of an external so he fell in love with like who I was on the inside which is how you should do it right you know? that's, that's great so yeah. like, now that I'm in shape it's you know it's nice to know that you can trust like who you're with and they're not with you just because you've got you know because you're pretty <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean it sounds kind of you know cheesy but it's true no though. it like, is yeah uh, and it, 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 you can you just have a better relationship when you actually care about the person and not like the shell that they're in in the body you know right where did you meet? Dallas, Texas. So are you both, were you born and raised there? Both no, I'm or? from East Texas, like Marshall. I lived in Dallas for about 18 years. Okay. He's from Montana. He oh. grew up in Montana and like he was born in Stockton, but he grew up in Montana and he's actually in Stockton right now. Uh, so he's, you know, was a West Coast person, I guess, for a long time. And uh, you live in Palm Springs? Yes, we do. Okay. How long have you been here? Uh, we moved here mid pandemic, May of 20, May 27th of 2020 to be exact. Wow. We flew across the country from Philadelphia on what felt like a private jet because no one was flying in May of 2020. <laughs> like it felt right. amazing. I was like, this right. is like, and uh, you know, for our mental, you know, it was like, okay, this is way less stressful than we thought. Cause there's no one else on the plane. Like I didn't have anybody six rows in front or behind me. It was just empty. So wow. it was comforting. Then you get out here from being quarantined in the city to now it's sunshine and hikes and swimming and like every day is beautiful. So it was the best place, right. in my opinion, to be quarantined. Had you visited here before you moved here? Yeah, we did. We uh, The week before Corona started, they actually kicked us out of Black Book on Arenas. They uh, kicked us out of there because the governor shut down all the bars and stuff on the Sunday. While we, you were there. Yeah, while we were there <laughs> at like 4.30. And like we, I was there and I, was, I just met Dallas Steele. We were hanging out. And like they kicked us out, and then like Dallas Still and I got like an infamous little kiss on the <laughs> at the moment the pandemic kind of started, at least in Palm Springs, and we oh. already decided that we we're going to move here. So two months later, we did. So, wow! Yeah, <laughs> I forgot about hmm. that. <laughs> and a little pre-podcast talk, you reminded me of something else because I was talking to you about another guest I had had on here, uh -huh. and uh, I don't think you were always a gay man. So tell me a little about yeah, that. Yeah, you know, with me. It, or maybe you were always gay, but right. let's talk about your life a little. So like, I, I felt like I, de I had delayed. I always tell people, like growing up in East Texas in like the 80s, we didn't have a lot of TV channels. We had like the 3, 6, 12, and 33. So we didn't have like a lot of options. And they would always play these old movies on the channels, right? And especially right. in the summertime. And I remember just being specifically attracted to Cary Grant and, and just being <laughs> like, when you're like five or six years old, you don't really know what sex is or you don't really understand it. Or you but, didn't know the word gay. Yeah, no. I didn't, but I just felt like kind of funny inside or just like there was a weird <laughs> feeling, right? Towards him and guys in general. And then, uh, you know, I guess I don't want to get ahead of you, but like when I was a minister, uh, I had to suppress all that. And I really, you, you just kind of like block it out of your system, I guess, as long as possible. And I felt like I was always gay, but I just didn't want to look at that side of me for the longest time. Is, and it was this, uh, like a Protestant church? Church of Christ, which is super conservative and strict. Okay. And so I came out 2015. So it was pretty late in life. I was 35. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like I always tell people, the short version of that is like life has been incredible since I did so and I've never felt better and more free and alive and just happier uh, so you were an actual minister yes for 16 years from age 19 Whoa. to 35 like very conservative like preach like from the, the main pulpit. guy in the church or one of the ministers one of the top, or... yeah one of the main two I would preach in the pulpit like I went to seminary when I was 19 I was kind of like the valedictorian of our class and they called me phenom and I was just like a really good like public speaker. And that's the last thing I ever wanted to do with my life. But I turned out to be good at it. So you kind of get, you know, you get people telling you in the church, in your little bubble, that this right. is your destiny. This is God chose you for this. Right. And so you start to believe it. And all of a sudden, you know, you're just locked into that system. Because I grew up in this church. Right. And it's kind of hard to escape it, especially when if I was to come out. I would, because I lived in the church house and the church property and all this, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your house. You're going to kind of lose everything. And I didn't, you know, I never had a wife and kids, so I wasn't really worried about that. Well, that, was, that was my next question because I didn't remember that part. <laughs> yeah. No so, kids, no wife. So and you I were am, single. I am a, I think, what do they call it when you're a C-section baby and you've never been. Oh, a platinum game. Platinum. That's a platinum. it. You're a platinum. Yes, I'm platinum. So you were like c -set. You've never been there ever. Never, ever. <laughs> I'm very curious, though. I was talking to my friends about it. I'm very curious. 
And like, I don't know if, I don't know if I'll ever do it at this point. Cause <laughs> <laughs> whoa. Yeah, I know. But yeah, platinum, platinum gay here. Okay. So you were in the church for all those years and you were knew you were attracted to men. Mm-hmm. So were some of the guys in the congregation attracted to you? I'm sure they were. I, I, I know that nobody came on to you. Uh, a couple, there was a couple passes, right? And I could, t- I could sense it, you know? Uh, and so it was always super awkward and I feel like we could sense each other, you know, but we're both like, he's, you know, so we never did anything with anybody in the church. Like anytime I ever started exploring my sexuality while I was still a minister, I would always drive like multiple hours away outside of Dallas just to do so. Cause I was so paranoid about someone seeing me out with some guy or something like that in Dallas. And then they would, you know, say, Oh, and then they would tell the elders and then I'm fired, you know? Right. And it's so like, you did, you did exploring while during oh, yeah. those years. And I, I was just afraid of a scandal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't need this <laughs> much drama, <laughs> but you were fooling around. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like my, I just, my first, I guess, sexual experience with a man was 20, I was 23. And then, and then, then it would happen. And then I would pray the gay away on the way home. And then it, about every six months is how long I could last before I could, not, you know, before temptation struck again. Uh-huh. Uh, so yeah, I would always, I'd always feel so guilty and you know make the promise to God that you're never gonna do it again. Right. But that doesn't work. Did you think that you would change or could change? Yeah, I truly like at that time in my twenties because I was so focused on ministry career that it's so easy to to block it out of your mind and just focus on right. you know the sermon you got to preach on Sunday or whatever. Uh, and I thought I could, and I thought I did, and I was always kind of like asking for forgiveness, but also proud of the duration of time between <laughs> sins. <laughs> did you um, ever attend like X gay ministries to get fixed or any of that no, stuff? No, none of that. Uh, oh. When I left the church, it was pretty. No, I mean when you're in the church. Oh, to try to like. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, I never did that. I never even thought about that. Well, uh, and if you did that, that would be acknowledging what was going on. Right. Yeah. We I don't could, do. That. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> See, and I don't think for the Church of Christ, there wasn't anything. I could have gone to like a different like denomination or whatever and done their program. But we didn't offer anything like that because right. that's just very strict. You know, if you know Southern Baptist, it's even stricter than Southern Baptist. Right. So, so did you quit the ministry and come out or how did that unfold? No, this was a, it's a good question. So I quit the ministry in the sense of like I got, I was working for a smaller congregation and I just didn't really like that. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave and do something else. Because in my head, I'm kind of like, okay, I need to process what's going on sexually with me. And a lot of other questions I have about outside of sex, I'm talking about like spirituality and like, do I even believe in God? And so those thoughts are kind of right. like bouncing around. And that, that was the bigger issue for me because I don't look at sexuality like it's that big of a deal. But the issue of like faith for me was everything because that's my livelihood. And also it's important for how you view the world and how you treat a lot of things. Right. Right. So I was trying to figure that out. And I left the church knowing that I was struggling with my faith at the time. So I still believed and I took a break from it and taking the break from it allowed me to actually for the first time in my life, because I grew up in the church and immediately started seminary, and then I immediately had a job. For the first time in my life as an adult, I could evaluate what I believe independent of my you know, financial livelihood, because I was working as a security guard at the Gaylord Texan, and I could just look at the things I believed objectively and without like, well, if I don't believe this, I'm going to lose my job. Right. So, There's no agenda. You could just it, look at it. Exactly. Gotcha. And so... Doing that, I was able to ask the hard questions and kind of, and this is all a process, right? It right. took about a year and a half before I became, at the time I became just atheist because I tend to do things at the extreme when I first start them. <laughs> like 150%. Yeah, yeah. Let's do and it. now I would say I'm more agnostic than atheist. Um, but it was a, it was a total process, a total journey. And at the same time, I was struggling with the sexuality and like, well, am I bisexual? Like, what's kind of my thing, right? Uh, and I figured that out. And that's when I met John. Uh, and the story behind that is that he, there was, I should have said this earlier, there was another John and I actually went to go meet that John. And so we were all three were a thruple and there was three Johns in one house. Like, and that's how that just the cliff notes version of that story. Whoa. And that was my first gay relationship <laughs> was with two other Johns at the same time. <laughs> how did, how that, ha- how that unfold? Okay. Well, like those typical way that people hook up. Like I, I, I was on some website, this is 2015, 2016, Dallas, Texas, I saw, well, he called him Big John because he was like 6'5", he's a big guy. 
and we started chatting on this. Was it, wait a minute, was Big John your guy now, John, or the other guy, John? The other one, yeah. Okay, the other one, okay. And uh, so met him on a lawn line, like gay side or whatever, and then I went over to his house to hook up with him, and they opened the door, and there's two of them, and there's, I guess my current he John. He got a two like, for Yeah, them. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't even know he existed. And he was, and like I immediately just kind of fell for them both at the same time. Uh, and so it was kind of like a bonus package deal. <laughs> so it was a, it was very interesting to start off with two people as your first gay relationship and not one. And, and that I was would, your first gay relationship. Yes. And I would recommend that you don't do that to anyone listening. <laughs> like, you know, take it a little slower. Maybe just start with one person, but to each right. their own. Because <laughs> it's hard. Okay, so continue. Well, then what happened? Wait, so I, I you process you myself through the, the ministry. You had that we'll call it a date. Yeah. And then how long before you moved in with them? Probably two months, maybe. And where and where did was where did all was this in Texas or yeah, where this was, was this it? was it was technically in McKinney, Texas. Okay. Which is like right outside of Dallas. Um so I moved in with them probably about two months after we had all started. But you know, once we, we had like an immediate connection and I would you know, go out there. I think I went back to their house like three days later. And at that time I had Monday, Tuesdays and Wednesdays off of work. So I would just leave work on Sunday, go to their place and just spend the three days with them anyways. We were already kind of like living together a couple weeks in at least half the week. So then they were like, do you want to move in full time? And I was like, you know what? Sure. Why not? I know. (laughs) Okay. I was very naive. Okay. Uh, So there's there's not two Johns today, so no, keep going. Uh, Big John actually passed away of a heart attack a couple of years ago. We were oh. all... I had moved to Philadelphia with my brother for a little bit, and um, we were... My John, my little John, had came to Philly to kind of win me back and have me come back together with them, because we were just taking some time apart. And uh, I was fully on board and ready to do that, and then Big John had a heart attack out of nowhere, and like he was texting me. Uh, the day he passed away and he was like talking about how proud he was of me and the things that I had accomplished in my life. And, you know, wow. and then John had just gotten back, little John had just gotten back from Philadelphia and he called me that night and I thought we were just going to talk about his trip. And he told me, no, you know, John passed away of a heart attack in his sleep, taking a nap. You know, he was 70, I think he was 73. This was like three years ago. He was 73. Yeah. So it was sudden. Wow. Yeah. And so then you went with little John. Yeah. Little John moved to Philadelphia. We spent about a year and a half there then we moved to palm springs and we love it here and i'm never leaving (laughs) well i never say never but like i don't want to leave (laughs) okay so was little john we'll just call him john now from this point was john you said he was totally ripped when you met him yeah so he'd always been an athlete no he, he has good genetics like he just you know he just likes working out and staying healthy like and he eats well he eats clean he watches his calories uh, and he was working out with a trainer, I think five days a week, which really, that's I can a speak lot. from experience, <laughs> like that's a lot. And that yeah, really yeah. will get you that's hard results. Yeah. 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 He was really in it and he still is. <laughs> so are you his trainer? No, no, we don't, we don't work out together. I don't train. We talk about stuff all the time and I'm always giving him like, you know, tips, advice, things to do. And I'll show him stuff, but we just kind of do our own thing. We work out at different times and I'm, we're both, he, you know, I'm just busier and I, just kind of work out when I can these days, as opposed to he just kind of goes at noon every day. So has he given you tips? Obviously I have a personal Mm -hmm. question here. Is he giving you tips on how to work with older guys because you have the age difference or (laughs) do you not need that? You know, like uh, there's a lot of crossover I'm finding in just being a minister and also being a trainer Uh because you just authentically care about people and their well being. And I've always like when I was doing hospital visits and visiting orphanage, you know, doing stuff like that ministry work, there's, there's a lot of similarities in caring for a human and then just caring for their body and taking care of them and how to treat them. Uh, knowing how to handle like heart conditions and like what weights and training, that's different for sure for like, you know, based on a person's health. Uh, but there it's, it's pretty easy to do. I mean, I enjoy the people that I work with, but I'm very selective with who I work. I don't just take anybody. Like, uh, you really only want to have like a select number of clients because you want to dedicate, I want to dedicate my time to them because I want their goals are my goals and I want them to achieve them. And if they don't, then like, I'm going to be upset with myself. So 
I want to make sure that I can focus on their nutrition, on their diet, on giving them the time they need in the gym. You know, I tell them like, if you guys are out eating dinner and you don't know what to order off the menu, just text me a photo of the menu and I'll show you. And I can tell, <laughs> wow. I, you know, like that's the kind of access I want to give right. them. And if you get more than 10 clients, you, you, you won't have a lot. I won't have a life because I'll be just be constantly texting people all day. And I'm very picky about who I don't just work with anybody. So they get all that just for paying you the train trainer fee. Or is, or is it yeah, like a I package mean, deal? How yeah, it's like it a work? package deal. Like it depends. I mean, you can go. Like I'm doing a guy right now. He's kind of a bodybuilder, uh, and we're just going month to month with him because you know he's already he's, he's starting at a very high level. Right. Like we're just trying to fine tune some stuff with him, but he's already so excited working with me that I know he's gonna. He's already wanted to do five sessions a week. Um, but it, it's more of a package deal by the hour, and it's always varying. Like if you buy a longer deal, then you're going to get a better rate per session. Uh, because to be completely honest, like if you try to go with a trainer for like a week or two or even a month, you're not, nothing's going to happen. You're going to look right. the same. Well, you have to be committed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you want, you want people who are going to commit to change and change usually takes two months, three months. But I can I tell you, I, I know I can radically change a person's body without any steroids, which I've never done ever anything. You can radically change your body regardless of age, regardless of fitness level, like in a couple of months time. And I wish this was, I wish I could show like the difference between that photo you're talking about where I was 245 and the photo eight weeks later when I lost like 45 pounds in just the eight weeks. Like, wow. because you can really do it if you know what you're doing. And you have somebody helping you and guiding you, especially with like the hardest part is the nutrition, the working outs. That becomes the fun part. Nutrition is where it's really at in terms of how to tweak and do things. I mean, I've, you know, as most people, I've looked at so many different diets and all this mm -hmm. stuff. So, I mean, there, so are you into any specific one? Nope. I don't you, diet. You, so you're, you're changing your lifestyle and your way of eating. Period. Yeah. I, I, you know, diet can get like a, there's a lot of, but or just, there's a lot of impact on that word, especially in our culture, because when people think about it, because diets like keto and all these, they're, they're companies trying to sell you something or a, a brand or a Nutrisystem or whatever. I don't look at it like dieting. I look at it like I, I eat things that I enjoy every day. And if I'm leaning down for a photo shoot, I just eat smaller portions of those things. And I eat French toast, I eat ice cream and I eat popcorn, but they're variations of those things, right? They're protein powder based ice creams the french toast is made with egg whites and sugar-free syrups like you can enjoy the foods that you, you can have a, a foods that taste good and and not be you know super caloric is mm -hmm. what i is what i try to like stick to and it's it, you know and i'll tell you right now just go on youtube right now and type in like healthy meals under 500 calories and there's a million channels you can find for free of stuff to eat that are easy to make i don't meal prep i don't diet i eat the same things every day and they all taste good at the end, you know, and that's, that's what, how you stick to it. It's a diet you, something you, you should what stick to. What do you eat every day? What do you, what, what's the uh, I do day? the French, so I do the French toast, which is any slice of type of bread you want, dip it in egg whites. Uh, I'll take a Granny Smith apple, chop it up, and I throw it on, all of it on the griddle, and then I'll eat that with sugar-free syrup. I eat it twice a day. I usually eat it twice a day. So one piece of toast? I like four pieces. What? Yeah. <laughs> like my, my carbs... My carbs are around like 300 a day. My protein's around like 180 grams a day. My fats are around like 60 or 70. Huh. Uh, and my calories right now are around like 2,200. You know, and that's just for me to maintain the current like body weight that I have. Right. So you don't have to, I mean, so I do the French toast. I'll answer your question. I'll do the French toast. I have these little 100 calorie Orville Redenbacher kettle corn. You get them at Walmart. They're 100 calorie bags. Uh, they're, it's like a smart pop, so it's low in fat, but the taste delicious. I'll eat like three or four bags a day. Uh, Is that the one with like flavoring on them? Uh -huh. or just plain okay, they have kettle corn. corn. They have movie theater butter flavor. Okay, but there's a hundred. They're hundred calorie bags, but they're big bags of popcorn, and they're high in fiber. Fills you up. I'll, I'll have like a sandwich wrap. I get these sandwich. They have these huge tortillas that are only eighty calories. Also at Walmart. It's not sponsored by Walmart. I'm you know, wondering like, here now. <laughs> I get these gigantic wraps. I, I, you just fill it with like vegetables, right? Cucumbers, lettuce, spinach. Just make it as big as you can with that stuff. Throw lunch meat on it. And the whole meal there is like 350 calories and you're full because it's a gigantic wrap. I eat two of them for 350 calories. Uh, and then you're full. And then I have the protein ice cream. I'm making 40 ounces of ice cream with this protein powder, xanthan gum, fat-free yogurt combination that I have. And... 
it's 40 ounces of ice cream for 250 calories. So you're eating food and it tastes delicious, all of it. Wait, so you, you eat 40 ounces of ice cream in yes. one sitting? Yes. It goes quickly because it's yum. Wow. Like, <laughs> Whoa. Like you've never sat down and ate a pint of ice cream. And, well, I'm saying 40. It's between 30 and 40, but it's a lot. Well, that, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. But the foods you eat, they're delicious and they fill you up. And so you never feel like you're dieting and you can make it all. Everything I eat is, be, I can make it within five minutes, five, ten minutes. Uh, and that's the key is like, because I used to try to meal prep and I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do like a bodybuilder thing. and I'm going to meal prep all this chicken and rice and then I'm going to like have it. All. And then two days into it, you have chicken in the refrigerator that tastes like rubber and you don't want to eat it. So I'm like, well, what am I going to eat for dinner now? I guess I'm ordering Taco Bell. You know, it's like right. you just got to have stuff that you can make quickly that tastes good. And like my new thing now is I take a, like a, a rice cake, which traditionally tastes like garbage. And I'll take a protein, this chocolate protein powder I have and sugar-free syrup. And I mix them up in a bowl and then I'll spread it on top of the rice cake. A rice cake has 35 calories and the protein powder has hardly anything either. And then I'll just, I'll literally put candy on top of it because I have the calories to spare. I'll get Heath, like the uh, toffee. Right. I'll sprinkle that on top of it. I weigh everything out on a food scale when I do this. So I know how many calories this is going to be at the, you know, per serving. And then I'll take some Lily's uh, sugar-free chocolate chips, sprinkle it on top. It's a delicious dessert and it's low in calories. And you don't feel like you're dieting when you're eating stuff that tastes like candy because right. you're eating literal candy. Yeah. So do you make hot meals too or not? Is yeah, it all I mean, sandwiches usually and the, Yeah, the hot meals, well, French toast is still kind of hot. But well, like yeah. <laughs> for a dinner, we'll have like spaghetti squash with chicken breast and like a lot of broccoli steamed and vegetables and stuff like that with, you know, some pasta. You could throw pasta sauce in it. The, tr the trick behind this, to, you know, to make this quick is you look at your calories like you do your money. And you have, it's just an easy number, 2500 right? If I say you've got $2,500 to spend on food today, like and if you if you spend more than twenty five hundred dollars, twenty five hundred is your calories, right? If you spend more than twenty five hundred consecutively days in the week, you're going to go into debt, i.e., you're going to gain body fat. And if you're under that number, twenty five hundred, you're going to lose weight for consecutive days. So you just look at it like a budget. I can spend a thousand calories or a thousand dollars on this one slice of pizza, but then I've only got fifteen hundred dollars left for the rest of the day. And that's Does how I get my clients. Does one slice have a, that I many? mean, it depends on I mean, where you're getting it from and what's well, on the pizza. Well, yeah. like if you have an inch of cheese on it, right? Yeah, exactly. Ugh. If it's deep dish or if it's the slices like the Sabaro, the huge pieces or whatever. And just so you just look at it like a budget and just know that like if you if you fall under those numbers, you'll be fine. And I try to tell clients that are trying to build muscle, you just try to get your protein numbers at a certain level depending on their body weight, and you're gonna be fine, and you'll lose weight and feel great. And drink more water. Well, you do look pretty good, I gotta say. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's why I wanted to photograph you. <laughs> and you did a great job at that. Oh. Any, up uh, just so are you having fun <laughs> are you having fun with the modeling thing? Yeah, it is fun. And that's where you have to look at it, I think. Like and that's the way I've always done it, is you should you should have fun with it. Right. And for me, losing all the weight and like being able to and having people like you want to take my photo knowing how I was six years ago. Right. Like it makes it's it's almost like makes me emotional when I think about and you think about how far you've come where somebody like wants to take your photo exactly and all the work that goes into that like it's 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 an honor you should always just have fun with it in life so what do you have the most fun with training modeling what else uh well between those two like i would say training because you know at the end of the you know when you see a really good photo of yourself it's great but that only lasts for like that little moment in time but whenever i i see a client truly connecting with like how much when, whenever they just love working out and i know that they're going to they're going to stick with this and it's going to change their life and all of a sudden they just it clicks with them and they and they they're motivated they're energetic and then whenever they're achieving their goals like there's just nothing feels better than that like it really does you know when you've changed someone's life by showing them how to eat better and now you know that for the rest of their life going forward they're just going to have a, a better life i don't know how else to say it like they're going to have a better life because they have more energy and they're healthy and they're just going to enjoy their quality of life more and like i helped them on that little journey or that for however many right. months they work with me you know and that that's definitely more fun i play a lot of video games too not, uh -oh. that, not as much these days, but like it's a good way to pass the time, at least for my generation. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, it's really been interesting on the podcast because so many guys I've interviewed have a religious, church, yeah. spiritual backgrounds. Uh -huh. And some of them are totally rejected. Some of them are trying to work things out. Right. But a lot of them come into some 
new career where they're really helping people. And that's what yeah. you said earlier, mm -hmm. where, you know, that's really where their heart is. And right. I think that, so they're transferring what they did into what they're doing now. Yeah. And that, that's what I hear with you. Right. And you know, when I started, I started bartending uh, when I moved to Philadelphia. Oh, the church I, wouldn't like that. And no, they would not, especially mine. Like you can't <laughs> even drink. So, you know, and, and I noticed that I enjoyed doing that because I enjoyed, you know, the sense of pleasure when you make someone a, a quality drink and they're happy and they're out having fun. And it's like, you're a part of that. Right. Uh, it's, it's called the service industry, but just, you know, helping in general, you'll find a lot of gay guys, if they're coming, especially from a ministry background, transitioning into things, because I searched men hard, like, what do I want to do now? If I kind of have two useless degrees in theology and biblical studies as an atheist, what are you going to do with that? So you, I was like, what am I, what, what's the most, makes the most sense, you know? And I thought, right. I was like, you know, I know a lot about health and fitness and I like helping people. So it's like, okay, let's do that. <laughs> right. That sounds great. Yeah. So if someone uh, lives in the Coachella Valley and they're interested in getting a hold of you, how would they do that? Do I give my phone number on here? Uh, or like, not. I don't really care. Do, do you have any web? I mean, thing I always could reach out to me on social media. I mean, I'm John okay. Woodruff on Facebook okay. and then my Instagram is at Woodruff 2940. And so if you just put at Woodruff, I'm going to be one of the first people that'll pop up. I'm sure. Okay. Like. I'll be the cutest one that pops up. Of course you will. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not even true. There's a lot of Woodruffs out there. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for coming, John. I thank appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me, man. This is right. awesome. This is a okay. great idea. Right. Like You're going to do so you. well at this. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.